All right, hopefully today I'm going to show you a new feature of GitHub Codespaces, and it's one that lets you run JupyterLab uh, on a GitHub Codespace and um, in your browser. So I'm going to show you two ways. I'm uh, first going to, in this shell, run uh, gh for GitHub command line interface, cs for Codespace, and then Jupyter, which says I want to open it in a Jupyter. And this is going to give me um, a couple of code spaces that I have set up. I'm going to uh, demonstrate the Jupyter Lab one first. So you just press enter. And this is starting a code space now. And in a moment or two, it should uh, connect to a browser and open the Jupyter Lab. Now it can take a while. Um, hopefully, this code space is already built and running because otherwise it takes uh, a while. So now it's starting Jupyter Lab and really hopefully any minute now we'll have a browser um, tab pop open. All right, there it is. And so what this is doing is it's connecting to that CS Jupyter Lab repo um, that you saw and that you can find in the uh, video description. And it's going to show me that repo now in a code space in a Jupyter Lab. So here we have our Jupyter Lab. I have four different uh, kernels installed. I'll show you uh, one example in each of these. Um, let's take a look at the Python one first. So this one um, just looks like a regular um, Python. You can you can run these. Um, here we're integrating the the volume of a sphere. Um, we can use uh, Plotly. I have I've pre-installed a lot of batteries with this. Um, and so this should uh, import Plotly and show us a little figure in a moment. There it is. So it's even, you know, interactive. You can zoom uh, everything. Um, I installed Pyomo and some of the um, nonlinear uh, IP op solvers and so you can see that runs and and here we uh, we use Jax so I already installed Jax because I like it um, here we enable Jax 64 bit and this is because I just like it to print four and not uh, not something else not the uh, device array uh, kind of thing so so that's kind of it that's Python um, I built the R kernel, so we can run a, an R uh, Jupyter Notebook as well, and make plots. We can run Julia, so with Julia, um, we can do all of the regular things. It's always nice to start print hello world. We can do these little ASCII, ASCII plots. Here we can do uh, a regular plot. Julia sometimes surprises me with uh, it takes a while. And there's some, some details here that I'll talk about um, when this is done that aren't super obvious now, but Julia likes to pre-compile uh, libraries the first time you use them. And one thing I've learned in the code spaces is if you um, if you don't do this, then it happens uh, every single time you, you rebuild the, the code space. I haven't figured out how to make that happen. And here we have just uh, forward diff, which is a, an automatic differentiation library in Julia. So we just make a function x squared, take the derivative of it and evaluate it. And the derivative should be 2x. And you can see that it is. And then finally, we have uh, racket. Uh, so racket is a, is a kind of lisp. And you can do uh, cool things like um, show these little figures in here. So this is uh, this is just a, a wonderful little language, or wonderful language to uh, to work in if you like Lisp. So um, that's that's basically it as far as it goes. Um, we have a full uh, full launcher. We can get a terminal, and this terminal runs Bash. You can see everything that's in there uh, in the GitHub re repo, 
If I uh, check out the status here, you can see we've modified a few of these, um, and I'm just going to discard those modifications uh, uh, at the end. And otherwise, you have uh, access to the full uh, full workspace in uh, in here. Now, how is this thing uh, set up? So over here, um, I'm going to go ahead and close this. Uh, over here is the uh, Jupyter Lab repo. We have uh, a dev container, and inside the dev container is a Docker file. And so this Docker file is where all the magic happens. Uh, this is building off of the Anaconda distribution. We set Bash as our shell. Uh, down here, we install a bunch of things. I didn't really show you. Um, I'll show if I remember in the next. Uh, next example, I, I put in um, all of the things you need for doing uh, PDF exports via LaTeX, um, some other kinds of things that we need, sundials uh, is for some differential equation solvers. Here we app get install Julia and R and Racket. And then um, here I set up a couple of things so that we have um, at the command line some pre-configured options for the NB convert. Here I set up a whole bunch of uh, Python optimizations and um, packages to install, the different NB converts. And then we do a couple of things down here as the VS Code user, um, including installing the Chromium uh, that we need. So, so this is what happens. Uh, this is how, how it basically works. And I showed you in the beginning that you launched it from the command line, but you can also come over to code uh, click on code spaces here if you have this set up and just click on this and it will launch in a VS code um, in the browser here in a minute. So this is also now connecting and we get uh, in here, here's the terminal and here I can just run uh, Jupyter Lab at the terminal and it will create a URL that I can click on. So down here, I just click on one of these, command click for me, and this will uh, connect to that Jupyter Lab um, like that. One thing that um, while this loads, uh, I'll note is that Dockerfile takes uh, easily 20 minutes or more to, to build. And that's partly because I have Anaconda and Tech Live and Julia and R and Racket um, installed. Um, but that's a, a feature. Luckily, you don't have to do it uh, very often except when you're developing it. So uh, if you want to add a new Python package that you want in the workspace uh, kind of perpetually, then, uh, then you have to add it to the Docker file and then rebuild it. And that takes, like I said, 20, 25 minutes. Um, here we can go down to uh, this, and what you'll see here is that it's going to uh, convert that Jupyter Notebook into a PDF via Web PDF, and there's two options, LaTeX and Web PDF. Um, I kind of favor Web PDF. It's a little bit um, more robust in my experience um, than than using LaTeX. And so here we have uh, some examples. Uh, I guess this. Maybe we'll have to uh, check some of those. Some of the things I've had trouble with in the past are, are definitely looking at the Plotly images. So I see it here. Let's try one more. Um, let's do export as LaTeX. Getting Plotly into a PDF is, you know, historically been tricky. Oh, what did I do there? Maybe not what I thought. Weird. I wonder why it's making a zip file. Oh, you know, because I picked the wrong thing. Um, save and export as PDF. It was making a, a zip file with uh, LaTeX files. So this is using NB convert under the hood and Failed network error. It's always something new with these. Um, and I'm still working out a lot of the, the details. But it is uh, super interesting that 
all of this is uh, is possible and you can run everything from github none of this is is local um, here you can see a, a version of that plotly um, so this is like a nice format that you might want for turning in a homework assignment for for grading or something like that and this works in all of those uh, all of these notebooks in racket and r and julia you can use nb convert uh, out of the box so this is a pretty fully configured environment for people to uh, try out using Jupyter. And you can see over here all of the things uh, that it's been done. So there's a couple of ways. Um, it's, it's possible that in the near future you will be able to um, natively launch your GitHub repo as a Jupyter lab straight from the GitHub repo um, with a button. Uh, right now it's kind of two two buttons you have to open it in VS code in the browser and then uh, and then launch it um, here but it, it might be possible to set this up so that it automatically runs Jupyter lab um, that that kind of thing is usually done in either in the docker file let's see where did it go yeah so in the docker file you can set an entry point or a command that would get run and so you you could probably get it to automatically do that um, and then there's also this dev container JSON file that um, has some configurations that can be done uh, after the container is created. So there's a lot of a um, lot of really interesting uh, possibilities here um, for running customized Jupyter kernels that are kind of tedious to set up, and you want to share the setup with other people. They can just run it, uh, create a code space in the repo, and use it. There are a few things that um, that are kind of interesting here. You can see that there are some modifications to the notebooks, but if I go back to my uh, repository, then uh, those are not going to be in here. So these um, these files have not yet been uh, modified. They're just living out in the code space in an uncommitted and unpushed way. So I'm still working out some you know some workflows where. You can close a workspace and automatically update, or um, or you discard it, and that's that's a potential source of confusion I can see, um, especially since you can open more than one code space. So here I can um, I can create more code spaces on this main branch or on other branches, and um, you can configure. Right now we have four cores, eight gigs of RAM, 32 gigabytes um, of disk space which is pretty reasonable for, um, for this kind of project. So that's it. Um, that is Jupyter in the cloud on a code space, and it's pretty, pretty interesting. Probably you would not have all of these things uh, going for any, any particular uh, project, but I put them all here just so I could show you what was possible. So hope you like it, and uh, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.